Welcome to Wesley. We're so happy that you have joined us today. My name is Lisa Osterlo, and I work here with the team at our Wesley at Tahali campus in Bonnie Lake. Um, a lot of you know that we have our folks that are attending this pre presentation virtually today, as well as people that have joined us in person at our Tehali campus. So I wanna welcome everybody who's attending today um, and let's go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining us for this presentation, The Road to Tax Savvy Retirement. As you know, we are here to be a resource for you. That is why we have these special topics. For those, of, for those new to Wesley, let me share a little bit about who we are. We are a not-for-profit retirement community that started 77 years ago. We have continued to grow in our service with campuses in Des Moines, Lee Hill in Auburn, Bradley Park in Puyallup, and to Holly here in Bonnie Lake. We have continued to be different through community, choice, and continuing care. Our campuses are active and energetic. The campuses are filled with fun, including our award-winning Wesley University extended learning classes. Residents have a voice through our resident board and become engaged through many of our programs. Here in Tahali, our residents recently visited a chocolate store, went wine tasting at a local cellar, took a trip to the Van Gogh immersive experience and had a great time at our recent St. Patrick's Day party. Regular exercise classes and trail hikes in our beautiful area of Bonnie Lake are very popular as well. Our campuses offer multiple living options and levels of care. In addition, we have our own Wesley Home Care, Home Health and Hospice. We can offer support in your own home as well as to our residents on campus. And I'd like to take a moment and introduce our campuses and teams at our campuses. Okay. With 19 acres, Lee Hill in Auburn opened in 2007 and is home to over 200 families. Wesley Lee Hill offers all care levels, including a 36 bed nursing and rehabilitation center with all private suites. Contact Maureen for more information about Lee Hill. I'm joining you today from our beautiful campus in Bonnie Lake at the foot of Mount Rainier. Wesley at Tahali is our, is our newest Wesley community. Our campus is amazing with lots of walking trails, parks, huge spacious community areas. The apartments are large with big windows letting in the natural light. You can call me or Emily here at Tahali to learn more about our campus here in Bonnie Lake. Wesley Bradley Park is located in the heart of South Hill, close to South Hill Mall, shopping, medical care, and Bradley Lake Park. Currently, Bradley Park has a few rare openings in catered living and memory care. Catered living is our Wesley supported living and offers assistance customized to your needs. Find out more about catered living by calling Joan at our Wesley Bradley Park campus. Our flagship community, Wesley Des Moines, offers independent cottages, brownstones, brownstone apartments, assisted living, skilled nursing, and memory care. They currently have move-in ready apartments located in the terrace building of Wesley Des Moines. With all of these great campuses, don't you wanna come see us? For those that tour, um, just let us know if you'd like to come by and tour any of our campuses, and we'd love to show you around and give you a private tour. And today we're going to be um, getting a wonderful bit of information about taxes from Alan, um, and his name is Alan Hensley. As a child, Alan watched his parents worry when a health diagnosis put a strain on their finances. He realized the importance of having an informed and trustworthy resource to assist in decision-making and became a certified financial planner with a bachelor's degree in economics from our own University of Washington. Alan has been a financial planner now for over 10 years, even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> Alan is originally from Puyallup and now lives here in the Tahali neighborhood of Bonnie Lake. He enjoys spending time with his wife and two young daughters. They love to hike, ski, and spend time outdoors as much as possible. Alan is on the board of a local nonprofit that supports youth sports in the greater Seattle area. Alan?
Thank you, Lisa, and hello everyone in person and online. I am very excited to be here. And today we're going to be talking about the road to a tax savvy retirement. It's a jam packed uh, presentation. So uh, I'm going to go through this first section pretty quickly so that we can kind of get into the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about today. Here's the agenda. We're going to do just a quick intro, talk about some rules, and then we are going to take a quick look in the rear view mirror. Take a moment just to reflect on where we've come as a country in terms of taxes, and that'll help shape the conversation around where we're headed, the trajectory that we're on when it comes to taxes. I want to make sure that we explore what the national debt and the U.S. budget and how that's all tied into taxes. Again, just to kind of set the stage for planning for the future. And of course, I, I want to make sure that you leave with some strategies on how to be efficient with your taxes in retirement. And I am going to go through a case study that describes how a Roth conversion might make sense for your investment plan. Uh, here's my team, just again, real quick, thank you for the introduction, Lisa. My name is Alan Hensley, Sierra Butler is also my team. She's not here today, but Scott Christensen, he's there in the back, he's gonna be helping out, making sure we get all of your questions answered. And you know, in terms of ground rules, encourage you to take notes. I do want this to be conversational, but a lot of the information that I am going to talk about is going to be in that booklet that you have in front of you. Uh, in between each section, I'll take just a moment to pause, make sure if there's any questions, we can address those. If, if it's maybe more of a complex question, uh, then I can address quickly. We might just connect after the presentation to talk about that. And again, I'd, I'd love for this to be somewhat of a classroom setting. So if you have a cell phone, please silence that. And before we dive into uh, tax strategies and tax efficiency. Just a quick comment on what is financial planning. Taxes are one component of a greater financial plan. So insurance, investing, of course, cash flow, all of these different components make up a financial plan. And taxes are just one kind of small piece of that puzzle. What we talk about today is one idea. But the same way I would never recommend you borrow your neighbor's toothbrush, please don't borrow your neighbor's tax strategy without actually thinking it through and, and you know, doing the math behind it. Uh, you know, it, a financial plan in a lot of ways is a completely different puzzle or maybe a Rubik's cube for every person that I meet with. So what we discussed today, again, maybe it's just food for thought. And, and again, Scott and I, we'll, we'll stay around afterwards if you want to dig into it a little bit deeper. But enough on the intro, let's talk about the history of taxes in the US. And again, I'm very cognizant, taxes aren't the most exciting topic in the world. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I get very excited about this, but I understand this, this isn't for everybody. Uh, so when we talk about taxes, we're also gonna talk about social security. And, and again, like I said, the US national debt and the US budget, how it all ties together. But uh, to try and keep this as interactive as possible, we do have a game we're gonna be playing throughout. So for everyone that's in attendance today, I'm gonna to ask for a little bit of participation. Uh, for those of you watching on Zoom, you know, maybe write down your answer on a piece of paper or something just to see how you do. But I, I think this will be kind of uh, helpful just to make sure that all of us are, are thinking in the right direction when it comes to taxes. And, and maybe this might be surprising, maybe you'll learn something. But let's just jump right into it, just to kick things off. If I was to ask everyone, what is the highest marginal tax bracket in the history of the US? So thinking back all the way back to when income tax was first created. And let's do this by a show of hands. So the highest tax bracket that we've ever had, what does anyone think? Who thinks it's A, 37%? Okay, what about B, 56%? All right, how about C, 70%? What about D, 94%? Okay, so getting a mix of answers. It's the first question, so this is the one time I'll give a hint. We had the highest marginal tax bracket when FDR was president. So some of you might be surprised to learn. The correct answer is 94%. Really high. Let me put that in context, though. It's really important that we all understand 1944, it's a very difficult time for the country. And believe it or not, most Americans did not pay income tax at this point. And that 94% number that you see there, again, this is a marginal tax bracket. So this didn't apply to everyone. 
it only applied to Americans that made more than $200,000 in 1944, which is a lot of money. You know, if we were to gross that up with inflation to $2022, that would apply only to those making more than $3 million this year. But still, I, th I think it's interesting to note, we do have this precedent, at least for a very high tax bracket. Let's fast forward. So now we're talking about 1980. Same thing, just love to kind of get a, a feel for the room. What was the highest marginal tax bracket in the year 1980? All right, who thinks it was 37%? Okay. Well, B, 56%. Who thinks it was 56% in 1980? Okay. Well, it's 70%. Does anyone think it was 70% back then? I think we can rule out D. We know it's not that. So some of you might remember paying taxes back in 1980. Again, technically the highest tax bracket in 1980 was 70%. Same thing. This only applied to those making $200,000 or more in 1980. And then just real quick history. When Reagan took office, he did get Congress to cut it from 70 down to 50. But still, 50 seems really high. In today's presentation, it's all about the US. Of course, I wanted to talk about what's happening here. But one slide, if we were to look at what's happening around the rest of the world, you know, developed nations in Europe, 45 to 70%, uh, where in Asia, it's at kind of that 50% range. This is present day. So kind of interesting to note when we look around what's happening. And, and let's talk about today here in the US. So present day, 2022, Probably a lot of you might be working on your taxes now, or maybe you just finished it. What's the current highest marginal tax bracket right now? Who thinks it's A, 37%? You know? What about B, 56%? Okay. I think, again, we can rule out C and D because we already know when that hit. And it's, it's 37. So right now, the highest marginal tax bracket is 37%, which just a few years ago, before 2017, it was more than 39%. So technically... We did just experience a cut not that long ago. And today's conversation is very focused on planning. We're trying to figure out some moves to take next to be more efficient in retirement. Looking at this chart here, you can see tax brackets have you know, the highest marginal bracket back at 94%, but it's kind of leveled off in the mid to 30% range over the last 20 or 30 years. I think that's important to note that we're not at the lowest point ever, but we're still kind of in that low range. And when we talk about how to use this information in a plan, it's really, un it's really important that we understand the difference between marginal and effective tax rates. So this is sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page so that when we do start to talk about planning, we understand that how these two different terms come in. So let's do, I think the best way to describe this is through just a hypothetical, or let's talk about a scenario. Uh, I'm going to talk about this fictional couple. Household income is $110,000 for this couple. I'm going to keep it really simple in terms of math. I'm going to use 2022 tax brackets. So using today's tax brackets, let's just figure out how much they pay in taxes. So let's start at the bottom, work our way up. If this couple made only $24,000, the taxes that they pay on that first 24,000 are technically only 0%. And that's because of standard deductions. They get to uh, reduce their income. So really the first 24,000 is taxed at 0%, sorry, zero. And then the next 20,000 is 10, 58 at 12. And then at 8,000, that's when they hit that 22% number. So they do cross into the 22% tax bracket. And this is where the misperception sometimes comes into play. If you just notice that, yeah, you hit 22%, sometimes people think, okay, well, that means that I pay 22% taxes. But if we do the math, we just kind of go across the board, figure out, yeah, they're paying 22% on the $8,000, but then it's 12% on 58,000, 10% on 20, and then 0% on that first 24. That number you see there in the bottom right, that 10,800, that's their effective tax rate. So effectively, they're paying about 10%. So even though, yeah, they did cross up to that 22% number, their effective tax rate is 10%. So, you know, again, this is just another way to say, hey, how much did you pay in total taxes? Effectively, about 10% of my income. Because when we talk about planning, this is question number four in the game, which is more important for short-term planning? 
So near-term decisions would be something you wanna do this year, maybe next year, but very, very short-term planning. Which is more important to really have a good understanding of? Is it the marginal tax rate? Who thinks it's marginal? Put your hands up. Or is it the effective tax rate? Okay, get in the mix. So for short-term, near-term decisions, it's really important that we understand how the marginal tax brackets work. Because in, in some shape or form, you do have control over your income in the current year. And that could come from taking a distribution from your IRA, you know, depending on how much you take, that's gonna affect your income. Or maybe doing a Roth conversion, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Understanding where you fall in the different tax brackets can help you plan efficiently to make sure that you're not jumping up into another tax bracket unexpectedly. Uh, but for, for long-term planning, when we're talking about yeah, looking out into the future, it's, it's easier and I think a lot more beneficial just to talk about the effective tax rate. And, and that's where we're going to get into it. But you know, the trajectory of taxes here in the US, you know, we have no idea what the individual tax brackets are going to be in 10 years. In fact, we don't know what they're going to be in a year. But knowing you know, effectively taxes, the effective tax rate is probably headed in that upwards direction, probably just gave away my answer to this question, but I, I'd love to just kind of get a gauge for the room. If you had to guess, you know, make an educated guess, what are, what's going to happen to the, the highest marginal tax bracket beyond 2026? So in just a few years, us as a group, do we think taxes will A, go up? Who thinks taxes are, are headed up? All right, getting more of a majority on this one versus who thinks taxes are going to go down? There's going to be tax cuts. Tax okay, so depending on yeah what we're talking about, maybe the tax, the highest ones do go through a bit of a cut. Uh, we don't know. So again, I wish I had that crystal ball, but making some guesses, uh, you know, just to bring up one research study, this was done by a couple of economists 10 years ago. So this was done a long time ago, but their recommendation was that very high earnings should be subject to rising marginal rates. So in other words, they, they believe that it makes economic sense for those rates to go up. And, and this is where we need to understand, well, why, why do they think that? You know, how did they come to this conclusion? And that's when we need to at least take a really high level view of our US national debt. A lot of different components make up the debt, Medicare, Social Security, pensions, healthcare, all of these different components go into our US national debt. And that's the number right now. And yeah, we. I did put all the zeros there on purpose. $29 trillion and growing. It's a huge number. And when we think about the national debt, there, some of those components are adding to that faster than others. And today, I, you know, I'm just gonna quickly talk about social security and Medicare. So one more history lesson, I promise. Let's talk about social security. This was you know, a pretty radical thing in 1935 when it was first created. When it was invented, there were approximately 159 or almost 160 people paying into the social security system for every one beneficiary. So about 160 to one ratio. And you had to be 65 to start collecting benefits. And ironically, life expectancy back then was 61. So they didn't anticipate people would be drawing these benefits for very long. Well, social security has gone through quite the evolution. So again, benefit payments started in 1940. They added disability payments in 1950s. And then the 1960s, we saw the creation of Medicare. And then they realized in the 1970s, there was this mistake in their formula, which read, led to really large increases. Of course, they had to fix that in 1977. And then 1983, almost 40 years ago, that was the last time Social Security kind of went through a major overhaul. It's been a really long time. And that takes us to today. So right now, there are approximately three people paying into to Social Security for every one beneficiary. So remember, in 1940, it was 160 to one. Now it's a three to one ratio. You only have to be 62 now to start collecting if you'd like. People are drawing those benefits for a lot longer. And some estimates say that we could exceed the inflows, the outflows could exceed the inflows as early as this year, and the reserves could be depleted by as early as 2034. So 
I'm not here to say Social Security is going to disappear. By no means. I, I don't believe that at all. But, you know, the retirement of the baby boomer generation, people are living longer. Interest rates have been so low for so long. Social Security reserves haven't gotten much interest. I'm sure this is something that you've seen in your savings or your CDs for the last 10 plus years. And for Social Security to change, or at least to get fixed in some regard, that means Congress would have to get together and agree on it. Which that doesn't happen overnight. So when we look at your Social Security statement, and this is the new 2022 version of the statement. So if you haven't received this yet, this will be what it looks like going forward. I just want to highlight what it says at the bottom. On the bottom of the statement, it says that we base benefit estimates on current law, which Congress has revised before. I'm just going to stop there. Social security, it's an estimate. It's not a guarantee. And it's based on the laws that we have today. So again, I want to reiterate, I don't believe Social Security is going to disappear, but it, it's possible that it could change. And, and understanding, and at least at least planning for potential changes, that's what I'm trying to just communicate today is maybe have a plan B, just in case it does change. Because the last question on this section, Social Security benefits are not taxable. I've already done my part by contributing to the system. So who in here believes that social security benefits are not taxable? Does anyone think that that is true, eh? Or yeah, I, I think this one's pretty common knowledge. Technically your social security benefits could be taxable. You know, up to 85% of your social security income could be subject to regular income tax. So when we try to do some financial planning, some cash flow projections for retirement, we need to account for all the expenses. Taxes are an expense. So again, with social security, something to plan for. So I, I wanna dig a little bit deeper into the national debt and the US budget, but quick moment to pause, a little check-in here. Does anyone in the room or maybe online have a question about what we just talked about or, or maybe something you thought of? I wanna just do a quick check-in, make sure we're all on the same page. Feeling good, going along? No one's asleep yet. All right, I'm gonna take that as a plus. So let's talk a little bit more about that $29 trillion. So the United States by the numbers, in my business, and if you've ever done a financial plan, you've probably seen a lot of pie charts. I don't like pie charts, but I do like pie. And this is gonna help us kind of conceptualize where we're at when it comes to the United States budget. So when we look at this pie, 78% of it goes to social security, healthcare, retirement programs, and then paying the interest on our national debt. 78% is just in those four things right there. The rest of it goes to military, uh, higher education, environmental causes. So all of these different components make up the remaining amount. So that, you know, when it comes, it's all said and done, uh, there's, there's not much left at the end of the day. And, you know, when the government is trying to figure out, okay, well, we've got this, this debt, uh, we've got this budget, you know, how do we kind of reconcile the two? Well, you know, think of it as your household budget. Uh, you know, when you're trying to fix the income and the outflows, you can either, A, one, try to make more money. The government's way of doing that is raising taxes, or they could try to spend less money. They could cut programs, they could cut the budget. Both of these are not very popular <laughs> options. So what do they do? They turn to option number three. Uh, for us as households, that'd be a credit card. For the government, that's issuing more debt. And, you know, when we think about that $29 trillion, you know, just a few years ago, you know, if we look back to 2005, that number was just under $8 trillion. It's, it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. So at some point, you know, option number, oops, option number three, we're going to have to slow down a little bit on that and probably look at option number one here, which is raising taxes. So that's where, again, when we try to make some projections of where we're headed as a country, it seems likely that taxes are probably gonna go up instead of go down. And again, the whole conversation today is, well, how do we plan for that? How do we reduce how much we have exposed to what could be taxed in the future? And that's where I wanna talk about that efficiency. I wanna, I wanna hopefully just give everyone here an idea of how to be efficient in retirement from a tax perspective. Uh, and, and this is one where, if you're taking notes, this is my favorite section to do it in. 
because we're going to talk about the tax efficiency ladder. Uh, I think this is a really helpful way to understand the different types of accounts that are available. And you know, everyone in this room probably has at least one of these types of accounts, if not two or three. And then what I mean by that is, from a tax perspective, if we start at the bottom, we're going to call this the lowest level or the most inefficient type of an account. These are your taxable accounts. Very simple. Think of like your savings account, or maybe you have a CD, at your bank or credit union, or just a regular investment account, you know, probably a brokerage account that you've invested in. There's no sort of tax benefit for making contributions. There's, you know, no tax-free withdrawals. But this is, you know, the, the way that we all start saving, I think. And, and again, there's more ways to be efficient. We're going to get to that on that next level. So one step up, the middle level there, those are tax-deferred accounts. And, and this is, you probably have a traditional IRA or maybe a 401k from your, your, your job. The money goes into these as a contribution into a tax deferred account. You get a tax break when you make that contribution. In other words, when you put money into the middle level account there, you get a tax break that current year. And then hopefully the account grows and grows and grows over time. And then you pay taxes later. You're deferring when you pay taxes. That's why they're called tax deferred. But it's that top level. This is where we'd love to have more of our money, especially if taxes start to go up. These are Roth IRAs. Technically, a health savings account, an HSA would also qualify as this. So I do want to make sure that there's more than just one type of a, a tax-free account. And you might have a Roth 401k. So if you're still working, or maybe you had one at your previous job, you might have money in a Roth 401k as well. But the way that a Roth works, it's opposite than the tax deferred. The Roth, anytime you make a contribution or you put money into a Roth, you don't get any sort of tax break. You don't get to reduce your taxable income in that given year. But once it's there, it grows and grows and grows tax-free. And, and that's, again, just having usually a combination of all of these accounts gives you flexibility. Later in life, when you need to take out a big withdrawal, if you have some money in a Roth and some money in a traditional IRA, you can have more control, especially if you know your marginal tax brackets, like we talked about earlier, it gives you that ability to plan effectively and efficiently. But let's talk a little bit more about how do we get money into the Roth accounts. There's two ways, and they both begin with C, but they are very different. So to put money into a Roth IRA, you can make a contribution or you can convert some of your existing traditional or tax deferred money. Uh, there's rules though. We need to understand that of course, the IRS has thought of every loophole that we might try to think of. So we need to understand if we want to make a contribution, let's start there, because I think this is the one that we're most familiar with. If you've got some money, let's say, in just your checking account or your savings account, or maybe you have a brokerage account, and you want to take some of it and put it into a Roth IRA, that's called a contribution. You're just moving money from that lowest level on the ladder to the highest level. And this you know, I, th I think is really straightforward and seems easy, but of course we need to understand there are restrictions. So number one, let's talk about how much you can do per year. Uh, and, and I put it both for the health savings account and for the Roth IRA, because again, these are both technically tax-free accounts, but for the Roth, uh, as you can see, you can put up to $6,000 per year into a Roth IRA as a direct contribution. And if you're over the age of 50, you can do another thousand. So a total of $7,000 can go into a Roth IRA if you're working. So that's the other thing. You have to be employed. The $7,000 that you potentially could put into a Roth IRA has to come from some sort of wages that you've earned. It can't just be money. If you're retired, you have to show some sort of income from a job. So that's restriction number one. You can't just put in as much as you want. And restriction number two is an income ceiling. So not only do you have to have some sort of income to make that contribution. If you make too much, let's say as a married couple filing jointly, if their income as a household is over 214,000, then they can't contribute anything directly to a Roth IRA. So number one, there's how much you can do per year. And then based on your income, depending on how much you make, you may or may not be able to contribute. So that's contributions for putting money in. 
And then real quick, I just want to make sure the whole point of having money in a Roth IRA is so that you can take the money out tax-free. There's a couple of rules there. I think this one's pretty common, rule number one. You've got to be at least 59 and a half years old to take that money out tax-free. But rule number two, this is one that not a lot of people know about. Uh, if you've never had a Roth IRA before, you do have to fund the account and have it be open for at least five years. Uh, you know, I, I call this the seasoning rule. You've got to let it season for five years before you can take that money out tax-free. So again, if, if this is a, a somewhat of a newer concept and you've never opened a Roth IRA before, this five-year rule is going to come into play. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. But let's talk about the other way to get money from a tax-deferred account into a tax rate. So remember, the contributions were going from the lowest level to the highest level. The conversions were going from that middle level up to a tax-free account. So for example, let's say you have a traditional IRA and you wish you could just take some of that money and turn it into a Roth IRA. Well, you can, that's called a conversion. You could do as little or as much as you want. But of course, the way that the IRS sees a conversion is something like this. So think of it as when you convert money out of that traditional IRA, it's as if the money goes first down to a taxable account and then up to the tax-free account. I, I show this example because I, I just want to drive home the point. If you convert some of your traditional IRA, every dollar that gets converted counts as taxable income. So yes, the whole goal is to get it into a Roth IRA so that it becomes tax-free, but you've got to pay taxes because remember, the money that went in here, you haven't paid taxes on it yet. So this is you know, where it gets a little more nuanced in terms of, well, you know, what tax bracket are you in? If you're in a very, very low tax bracket, it could make sense to convert some of your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, knowing that you'll have to pay some in taxes. And don't worry, we're gonna really dig into the weeds when we do the, the case study in just a second. But when you do this, you just have to make sure if you want to go into this without any surprises, you do the math ahead of time, you read the fine print, you understand what it means to do a conversion. And I will say before 2017, if you converted money to a Roth, so from your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, there was an undo button, but they got rid of that. So it's even more important that you figure all of this out ahead of time. And again, if you've never had a Roth IRA before, starting that five-year clock, probably sooner rather than later, is going to make a lot of sense going forward. Uh, I, I want to just dive into this five-year clock real quick, and then we'll do the case study. So here's how this five-year clock potentially could work. This is a really simplified version, but if you've never had a Roth IRA, let's say after today's presentation, you think to yourself, yeah. Helen knows what he's talking about. That's great. I'm going to go home. I'm going to open a Roth IRA for the first time, but you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to put $10. In. So it's, it's March. It's almost the end of March, 2022. When you put that money into a Roth IRA for the first time, or, you know, technically anytime you put money in, you do get to rewind the clock back to January 1st. So again, when we're talking about timeline here, it really is calendar year. So if you made it today, or if you made it in November of 2022, think of it as if you made it on January 1st of this year. So that's the good news. You get a little bit of a bonus. But let's say some time goes by. All of a sudden it's 2026 and just the, the writing's on the wall. You've read the headlines. Congress, they've made changes to the tax law and, and taxes are going to start to go up. So that's when you think to yourself, okay, I need to get more money into this Roth account. And that's when you decide to do $100,000 conversion. So, you know, a really big chunk of, let's say, your traditional IRA, you want to convert that over to Roth. And when you look at this timeline, I, you know, I think it's pretty easy to see here. Most of the money in your Roth IRA at this point is all going to come from this conversion that happened in 2026. But when we think about the rules, I'm making some assumptions here, but I'm assuming that you're at least 59 and a half years old. When was the account funded in this scenario? Well, technically it was funded January 1st, 2022, which means tax-free withdrawals can start 27. Even though most of the money got in there in 2026, this money didn't have to be there for five years. The account just had to be open for five years. So that's what I mean by, if you're thinking about doing this, 
it probably makes sense to get started sooner rather than later. And I'm going to pause again. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Any questions? Did I go over everything too quickly? Let me know. Yes. Yeah, I didn't quite follow you there at the end. You want to convert now. Mm -hmm. And you're way older than 59. Yes. So you have your required minimum distribution, mm -hmm. which can get pretty high and pretty ugly with the IRS. Yep. And you're saying that you can convert that without paying the taxes on it? Uh, okay. So to kind of two parts of the question. Let me let me just make sure I, I heard you correctly. Let's start with the second part. You have required minimum distributions starting at age 72, or, or depending, it might have started at 70 and a half. And, and are you wondering, can you convert those RMDs to a Roth? Okay, the short answer is no, you can't. If you are uh, past the age of 72 and you're required to take out distributions from a traditional IRA, those required minimum distributions cannot be directly converted to a Roth. The IRS has thought of that. But you can do above and beyond your required minimum distribution. So if you wanted to take out more, you could convert that more over to a Roth IRA. Now, I, I wanna be clear, I'm not suggesting or recommending that is what you should do. It's just possible. And again, depending on the tax bracket that you're in, we, we wanna be very careful about that. Uh, and then the first part of your question, if I heard you correctly, the five-year rule, if if you're in retirement, and let's say that it's before your required minimum distributions kick in, you can convert some of your, your IRA or all of it, again, it's up to you, to a, a Roth IRA. It's just if you've never done that before, then we need to start worrying about the five-year rule. And, and this is, again, I'm already starting to get into the weeds. We can definitely take this offline after the class and, and dig into it. But I think the case study is also going to help kind of walk us through this. So we're going to go to that in a second. Yeah, Lisa. One more question. Yeah. What if you transfer Roth money to a different account holder? Does the five year restart? So the question is what if you transfer uh, your Roth account to a different holder? And, and I think the, maybe the question is what if I, I close my Roth IRA at this one brokerage company and transfer it to another brokerage company? Uh, it, it depends. So that's a tricky one. <laughs> depending on what you're trying to accomplish, depending on what age you are, I'd love to learn more context around it. Uh, but I will say that a lot of times it does make sense to keep your oldest Roth IRA open where it can get tricky. And maybe I'll just add some context to this question. If you have a Roth 401k. So today's conversation, I'm, I'm mostly talking about IRAs. Let's say that you're still employed or maybe at your previous employer, you did have a Roth version of your 401k, something that's become a lot more popular over the last five to 10 years. If you've had a Roth 401k for a long, long time, and then you transfer that out to a Roth IRA, the clock does restart. It doesn't matter how long you had that 401k, it matters about the IRA. And again, this is getting you know really deep into the weeds on specific situations, but I just wanna say, there's this whole different set of rules when it comes to 401k, so employer-sponsored retirement accounts. But I love the question. Yes, sir. Is there any advantage of having more than one Roth? So the question is, is it or can it be advantageous to have more than one Roth IRA? Um, well, not necessarily, uh, unless, you know, kind of related to that previous question. If you've had a Roth IRA open for a long, long time, and then you just happen to open one somewhere else, again, having that one open for more than five years can be advantageous for that five-year rule. Oops. Um, but depending on maybe your investment choices, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with it. And again, if we're talking about 401k and IRA, that can make a difference. But for the most, in most cases, it's not really advantageous to have IRAs in different places. Consolidation makes a lot more sense. Good questions. I really like this. Any, any anything else? Oh, yes, sir. What is it? What does it really mean when it's funded? So the question is, what does it mean to be funded? Yeah. Yep, that means to put money in it. Funds, 
how it's done make any difference? It's just growing it by any means or well, growing it by the investment itself growing? Is that funding it? So no, funding it would be either a contribution or a conversion. So doing one of the two, directly putting money into it would fund an account or converting some of your traditional IRA, that would also fund an account. The growth that happens because of the market, that wouldn't matter. Well, I'm saying if you have an investment, you have a $100,000 investment, it's just been there for years and it just sits there and goes by, you know, normal growth. Mm -hmm through or whatever, and then you decide you want to convert, but has it been, in, but you haven't been putting any money in. Right. Has it been funded? So the, the question is, if the growth continues over a long period of time, does that count as funding? No, no that doesn't count. That, that growth that happens, of course, the balance will change in the traditional IRA, but to fund the Roth IRA, that would have to happen through a contribution or a conversion. You have to contribute. Correct. Yeah. So that's that's different. So if you aren't contributing, growing just on its own, let's say, going up and down. Oh, yeah. But if you're not contributing, you're not sending the check in or your earnings from your earnings withdrawal, in some way you're not funding them, then you could not qualify convert that to a Roth. Oh, okay. So I, I think I'm hearing your question. Are you asking, does the traditional IRA need to be open for five years or more? Because let's say you've got a traditional IRA uh -huh. and it's just sitting in, in an investment fund of some kind. Right. And it grows and you decide, okay, I've had that for all these years. I should probably have converted it to a Roth. I did. Mm -hmm. So I want to convert it now. Yep. Can I do that? I haven't been putting any money in it. So oh. Yeah, so the question is, do, do, is there any sort of time constraint on when you convert from traditional IRA to Roth? No, you can do that at any time. That, there's no time constraints on when you do that. It's just about when does the Roth first open, I think is a better way to say it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But, yes, ma'am. But the only advantage it seems like to me is that because you still have to pay taxes. Correct. And so if you convert your IRA to a Roth, you pay taxes when you do that, mm -hmm. not when you take it off from the Roth. Correct. And if the tax bracket stays the same, or for that matter, mm -hmm. it even goes down because your income goes down, it might be a wash or it might not be beneficial at all. Exactly. So the question, just to repeat for the Zoom, uh, when we do a Roth conversion, the reason that we do it is so that we can save on taxes later in the future, because you're absolutely right. When you do a Roth conversion, you pay taxes. And there's kind of two reasons on why you'd want to convert. The main one is because you think you'll be in a higher tax bracket later or taxes could go up. And we're going to talk about the second reason in a second, but that's a really good distinction. We want to not pay uh, extra taxes up front if we don't have to. Minimizing and again, being efficient in taxes is how we would use this strategy. And we'll, again, we'll dig into that in a second. Yes, ma'am. So there are cases where it is not a good thing to do. To so the question again for the, correct. Yep, so the question is, in some cases, does it make sense not to do a Roth conversion? Absolutely. So that, and this is, I'm gonna go back to the, the slide in the beginning. This is where don't borrow your neighbor's toothbrush, don't borrow your neighbor's tax strategy just because it worked for them. It might not work for you. And, and again, this is where we need to really flesh out does this make sense for your plan? Yeah. Yes, sir. What difference does it make to your inheritance sentence, whether it's a Roth or a not? Yep. So the question is, what impact is, does a Roth or a traditional IRA have on your heirs, your descendants for legacy planning? I'm going to put a pin in that question because I've got a great section on that. We're going to talk about that in a second. Yep. All right. Real quick, Brent, was there anything online that I missed? All right. So let's keep going. I love the, the interactive, this is great. So let's, let's really kind of talk through a, a what if scenario. So I think this is gonna hopefully answer a lot of questions, but again, we'll, we'll dive into anything else you wanna talk about. But let's discuss Bonnie and Bob. Hypothetical couple, uh, they're both 62, they're married finally jointly, two adult children, they own their home, no mortgage, and, and they've got investments in all types of different accounts. Their only income uh, in retirement is gonna come from social security. 
So no pensions, no outside work, pretty simple scenario. Uh, their goals in retirement, again, I think are pretty common. They wanna have a comfortable lifestyle in their retirement years. They wanna be as efficient as possible. They don't wanna pay extra in taxes if they don't have to. And they want to preserve as much net worth as they can for their children and grandchildren. So when we look at their situation, it's pretty common. Their net worth, uh, I won't go over each line item here, but they've got about $2.3 million invested. Uh, you know, they're hoping that their investments grow over time at a you know, moderately conservative pace. And most of their net worth uh, is going to be in their other accounts that aren't Roth. So this is pretty common. I see this a lot where most of the time going into retirement, you might have a small amount in Roth IRAs, but not too much. And they're, you know, if we were to map out their net worth over the years, again, they've got a conservative lifestyle. They don't spend too much. Their portfolio will grow. And then, you know, at end of life, there's a lot of expenses. So at that point, they'll see their net worth go down as their expenses start to increase. And again, this is assuming that they live to age 90. So again, pretty kind of typical uh, spending goal for retirement. And not gonna spend a ton of time on, on talking about you know, the mechanics of this, but whenever we do a financial plan, whenever we do a financial projection, we do a probability test. We wanna figure out what are the odds? What's the probability that Bonnie and Bob are going to enjoy retirement, spend what they wanna spend and, and have that comfortable lifestyle? And the way a probability test works is we ideally we'd want them to fall somewhere in that 75 to 90 percent range. I do stress whenever we're doing probability testing, you can't think of this number like a test score, like in school. The goal here isn't to get 100 percent. You can't get a, an A plus on this test. And, you know, again, just to talk about a little bit, technically, you can't get 100 percent. 99 is the highest score on a probability test. But what we're looking at is what I call that Goldilocks zone. Again, that's why 75 to 90% is where we're hoping they'll fall, because that means with some confidence, they're gonna enjoy their retirement years. Now, as a financial planner, it's my job to stress test this and throw different scenarios at it. One of those is, and, and again, I'd love to kind of gauge everyone here in the room or, or at home, write it, write it down. What does everyone think? If taxes go up, what's gonna to happen to their probability of success? So if, if taxes go up, again, we're making some general assumptions here. Does everyone think that A, their probability of success will go up? So who thinks? Or what about B? Will taxes increasing make their probability of success go down? Who thinks it's B? Yeah. So again, we're, we're making some assumptions here, but if taxes go up, this is a pretty aggressive, but again, just to make the point here, let's say that taxes go up by 10% over eight years and they do nothing. They don't change anything in their plan. They don't do any sort of tax strategies. All of a sudden that 81% likelihood of success drops down to 67. And this is kind of the, you know, you can see it, it's in the red shaded area. This is that warning light that says, okay, we should probably think of some ideas on how to change this. One of those ideas, is what if they did a Roth conversion or they started to do small Roth conversions in their 60s before their RMDs kick in. If taxes do nothing, if taxes stay exactly the same, that 81 turns into 84. But again, let's assume taxes do go up. All of a sudden it's 77, which again, just to remind everyone, it was 67. But if they do Roth conversions and we assume taxes go up, they're still in that, that blue area there. It's still a probable, successful retirement. And again, no one has the crystal ball, but we've got to just at least put together some educated guesses on what could happen. So this is, I'd say, the effective strategy for how Roths could help during your lifetime. You're setting yourself up so that later in life, you have this tax-free bucket to draw income off of you don't have to worry about what the marginal tax brackets are. You don't have to worry about taxes because it's going to be tax-free. But uh, I, I love where the questions from that previous section were coming from. Required minimum distributions, that's one of those, I'd say, at least headlines or triggers that we need to pay attention to because typically in retirement, your income stream kind of jumps up when you hit age 72 or when required distributions begin. 
you know, it could be to a point where your required minimum distributions are more than you spend in a year. And that might not happen at 72, but it could happen later in life, your 70s or your 80s. All of a sudden you're required to take out, you know, so much from your IRAs that you have to pay taxes on it. So one idea is the more that we can get converted from traditional to Roth before age 72, that's going to reduce the required minimum distributions because from a Roth IRA, not only is it tax-free, but there are no required minimum distributions. You don't have to take money out of a Roth if you don't want to. And, and going back to the question about legacy planning. So when we talk about your heirs, when you talk about you wanna leave money to your children or your grandchildren, a traditional IRA that has those RMDs. So again, let's shift our thinking a little bit. Let's look at this from your beneficiaries point of view. So your children inherit a traditional IRA. They've got required minimum distributions that they have to take out. And yeah, they have to pay taxes on those distributions. So again, we don't know what taxes are gonna be in the future, but if taxes go up, they'd have to pay more. And typically when your, your adult children or your adult grandchildren receive an inheritance, it's usually in their prime earning years. They're, you know, they're working, they're probably not retired they're gonna to have to pay at their top income tax bracket when they have to take the distributions from an inherited IRA. But a Roth IRA is different. Now, technically, again, from a, a beneficiary's perspective, yes, they do have required minimum distributions. So if you own a Roth, you don't have RMDs, but if you inherit a Roth, you do. But again, the big takeaway, no taxes owed. So even when someone inherits a Roth IRA, you're passing down that tax-free status, which again, you know, depending on when the inheritance happens, if it's in their prime working years and they have a high income, they don't have to pay, worry about also paying taxes on the money that's in a Roth IRA. So from a cash flow perspective for yourselves, Roth IRAs give you that flexibility of tax-free income and also from a legacy planning perspective, that can really help out. Everything we talked about today is, is relatively high level. And, and we just kind of scratched the surface on, and I loved the question earlier about, does this make sense for everyone? Because the answer is no, this, this strategy is kind of just looked at in a vacuum on all those assumptions today. Uh, we're here, uh, and I'm gonna stick around and answer some questions afterwards, but of course, if you wanna take a deeper dive and figure out your financial plan, let's, let's book a meeting. My card hopefully is on everyone's table. You can always scan the QR code you see there. But if this is something you want to flesh out, totally free, you know, no obligation, no commitment, we're, we're happy to chat with you. And it's always my goal to hopefully point you in the right direction and, and answer those more specific questions. Uh, but as a group, that's it in a nutshell. Are there any additional questions that maybe I didn't answer? And it looks like, yeah, from online, Lisa. Yeah. We just had a, a couple of comments. So do you mind mentioning that if you're on Social Security, you must be aware of the increase in Medicare premiums as your AGI reaches certain thresholds? Yep. So I just want to make sure I repeat that correctly for, for everyone. So uh, someone had mentioned if you are receiving Social Security and you're also uh, on Medicare, if your income increases, your Medicare costs will increase two years later. It's called IRMA. It's an increase to how much you pay for Medicare. And it's kind of a delayed response. So if all of a sudden in one calendar year, your income takes a jump, which could happen if you do a really large Roth conversion. I think that's what the, the attendee was bringing up. Just you know, be aware that your Medicare premiums might go up two years from when that happens. So again, and that's where the complexities, think of this as a domino. One domino falls over and affects a lot of different areas. And, Medicare is definitely one of them. And then he just mentioned that um, there is no required annual minimum distributions, which you've already mentioned. Yes, yeah. So just uh, as a reminder, there's no required distributions from Roth IRAs, which again, gives you more flexibility uh, for yourself and in the future. But there is for someone who inherits. Correct. And you know, just, to, just to maybe dig into that a little bit more, required minimum distributions for your heirs. So if you inherit a traditional IRA, or a Roth IRA, the new required minimum distribution for beneficiaries is everything has to be withdrawn within 10 years. So there used to be a way to stretch out 
those required minimum distributions over your lifetime as a beneficiary. Uh, after 2019, so starting from 2020 on, if you inherit an IRA of either kind, traditional or Roth, you have to withdraw everything within 10 years. And then I'm gonna put a little asterisk next to that comment. Right now, Congress is going through and thinking about changing those rules again. So we, we could have a whole new set of rules for beneficiaries by the end of this year. But as of right now, there's this 10 year clock that starts ticking when you inherit an IRA. Yes, ma'am. Say you're pushing your 90 mm -hmm. and you still, you know, have these big RMDs and high tax rates. Um, I think it might make sense to start gifting mm -hmm. money to your children and grandchildren yeah. instead of letting them get stuck with this labor. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the, the question or the comment is, you know, if you're in your later years, your 80s, your 90s, and you have these intentions to leave a legacy, it might make sense to start gifting while you're still alive. And, and yeah, the annual gift limit in 2022 is $16,000 that you could give to a person in a calendar year. A, a, another way to potentially reduce your overall estate, which could potentially save on estate taxes for your heirs and beneficiaries, which... Uh, again, the federal limit, uh, I'm again getting into the weeds a little bit, but for estate planning purposes, the federal estate tax exemption is a little over $11 million. But here in the state of Washington, it's $2.193 million. So if your net worth is over, let's call it $2.2 .2 million, there is some careful estate tax planning that you want to do while you're still around. Any other questions? I think I'm seeing some nods. I'm seeing some, hopefully, people, this sinks in a little bit, but I get it. Uh, this conversation, you know, could, could go on for a lot longer in a lot of different directions. But I just want to say thank you for, for having me here today. This was a great uh, topic. Hopefully you learned something. And yeah, let's, let's chat afterwards. Okay. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Alan. That was great information. And I'm sure it's all very useful to all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. <laughs> right. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this we will get this recording out to the folks that weren't able to attend and want to see that. Um, so the folks that have attended online, uh, this recording will be available as well. Um, so again, if you'd like any information on any of our campuses, Des Moines, Auburn, Puyallup, or here at Tahali in Bonnie Lake, uh, please give us a call. And thanks again. Bye for now. <laughs>